Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, said, Give, and it shall be given unto you. And he meant in every realm of our lives, not only in finance, and perhaps more important, to give our very selves unto God. And we can never stop doing that every morning and every day of our lives. And it is only as we give unreservedly our lives, our intellect, our body, our mind, our spirit, our very soul, it's only as we give this to God, each day can we grow in the knowledge of God. Can we be used of God? Make no mistake. There is no other way except complete surrender. No other way. You may play a little, I may play a little, but there's no power, there's no holiness, there's no impact, there's no joy, there's no hope, there's nothing except a drudgery. If you want the real life of God, it must be dedication. Play as long as you like, you'll never enjoy God. You might as well go in the world in one sense. God forbid that you should do that. I would sooner people hang on by the skin of the teeth. But I pray that I and others may come through in utter dedication every day of our lives to the living God. That's the only life worth living. If we do, God promises that he'll give us ministry. He'll give us gifts. He'll use us because we're vessels that he can use. And uh, we are on the gift of teaching. The need of the church is holy, sanctified, unselfish vessels. People whose mouths have no corrupt conversation. People who hold the tongue and realize that in a multitude of words they wanteth not sin. People who are utterly God's. God needs that kind of a vessel. And he can use them. And he says, wait upon your ministry when you've dedicated your life. And here, wait upon teaching. And we've seen that you can have a natural teaching. And it's very acceptable. It's quite right to use our intellect and our mind to teach people. And then there's the false teaching that we looked at. False spirits. They may even use the language of God. Wolves in sheep's clothing. They cause havoc because they look like the real thing. And perhaps 80% of what they say is scriptural and true. But the heresy is the thin end of the wedge that can lead to utter disruption, division in the church. It's a narrow walk and the ministry is not for novices. Our lives must live up to what the Bible says. But we're looking now at anointed teaching. Teaching that is inspired by God. And we've looked at that a little last week. We're looking at it again this morning. Anointed teaching is Holy Ghost teaching. It's teaching through the Spirit of God. It's having the Bible revealed through the Spirit of God and then teaching it. Now, it's not as man teaches. Holy Ghost teaching is completely different than what the natural man will teach. A natural man can teach without being dedicated. But you can't teach Holy Ghost ministry without dedication. It's not a natural kind of teaching. It's not as the spirit of the world teaches. By reading books or philosophy or clever writers, even Christian ones. They're but men. You may have new truths, you may have new fantasies, you may have new exciting things to be told, but that doesn't say it's Holy Ghost. It's not as the world teaches, not as man teaches, not as human wisdom teaches. For there's no man knows the things of God in all their depths, even the greatest man that has ever lived. Only the Holy Ghost knows that. Now that's the kind of teaching the church needs if it's going to be the church that will do a real work for God. How does the Holy Ghost teach? In 1 Corinthians 2, verses 12 and 13, we read this. Now we have received not the spirit of the world. You've not received the spirit of the world. You had that when you were born. And it's grown on you ever since. Not the spirit of man, not the fallen nature, 
We have not received the spirit of the world when we say we had that. But the spirit which is of God. When we receive Jesus Christ, we receive the spirit that is of God. And the Bible says to as many as received him, he gave them power to become the sons of God. Why? Why have we received the Spirit of God? That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. How did you know that you were saved? By the Spirit of God. No man could bring you revelation. When Peter knew that Christ was the Messiah, the coming one, Christ said to him, flesh and blood, human nature, human intellect, philosophy, did not teach you that. Blessed art thou, Simon Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. The only reason you know you're saved is because the Spirit of God revealed it to you. And the cleverest illustration, the most perfect uh, description of salvation, simple as you like, you can talk about it, you can explain it, you can illustrate it as simple as you like. But unless God reveals it, they'll still stay dead in trespasses and sins. That is why when our June crusade comes, it will not be by the wisdom of man's teaching or the enticing words of men or the illustrations that will tickle people's fancies. It will only be the simplicity of the cross and the mighty power of God. We're not looking for sermons or theology when we're te teaching dead people. How can you make a dead person hear? You can't. You're wasting your time. It is an explosion that they'll awake in the Spirit of God. Then you can teach them. How do we know anything at all? Except through the Spirit of God. That you may know the things that are freely given to us of God. How do you know Jesus is coming again? Says it in the Word. That doesn't convince you. The Holy Ghost witnesses with your spirit. God, a man can't teach you that. There are many men in the ministry who will tell you about the coming of the Lord and they'll explain it and they'll say it with head knowledge but they haven't got that true knowledge that it's going to happen. Amen. Only the God can teach you that. And we deaden the church if it's the letter of the word. It's the spirit of God we need. That's Holy Ghost teaching. Verse 13, which things also we speak. Oh, listen to it. Listen to it. And it register. Which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teaches. You can't teach Holy Ghost things by human intellect. But which the Holy Ghost teaches. How does he teach? Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Our part is to learn the Bible naturally. Our part is to study the Bible with our natural mind. Our part is to memorize the scriptures. Our part is to hear the word of God. Our part is to meditate in the word of God night and day. Our part is to believe the word of God. That won't teach us the deep things, but it will give the knowledge that the Holy Ghost then can bring the scriptural, spiritual truths and compare them so you know. I'm amazed how men take things out of the context. I had a minister write to me about the divine healing ministry because he'd been informed. And when I read what he said, I was absolutely amazed how much darkness he was in. Leading a flock of God. And he put a couple of questions to me. I'm going to answer them by letter. And as soon as he put them, I think he thought he would confound me. As soon as he put them, floods of scripture came into my mind. I wrote them down. I was about an hour writing them all down. I thought, my goodness, he's going to get an answer. Taking just an odd little thing or his own human idea and what he's been brought up to believe instead of the Holy Ghost teaching him from the Word. They don't even believe the Word. They only believe a tenth of it. Before we can do anything, we've got to have faith in the Word. Listen to the word, read the word, meditate on the word. That won't teach you, that'll prepare you. Then God will teach you. There's no inspiration without perspiration. You've got to study. The Bible says so. Study to make yourself a workman that needed not be ashamed. 
rightly dividing the word of truth and comparing spiritual things with spiritual. That's how we find out our first job is a natural one. We've got to study the word. We've got to hear the word. We've got to meditate on the word. We've got to meet in the Bible groups. But that isn't Holy Ghost teaching. That's preparing for it. I'll give you an example. Are you ready for a puzzle? Are you ready for something that's absolutely confounding? Well, you can study this forever unless the Holy Ghost teaches you. I've been looking at it now for 30 odd years and I still don't know all about it. Let me read it to you from Ezekiel chapter 1. Now, what natural mind can understand this? What worldly spirit can understand this? Listen, I'm going to read you from Ezekiel. I'm not going to explain it because I'm going to bring in something from the New Testament. But listen to this. Verse 5 and 6 of the first chapter. Also, out of the midst thereof, came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of man. And everyone had four faces. And everyone had four wings. Can you understand it? Do you know what it means? In a vision. And then let me give you 13 and 14. There's a lot more besides. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals. A fire. Their appearance was like burning coals of fire. Yet the living creatures had four faces, and four wings. Do you understand it? And like the appearance of lamps, it went up and down among the living creatures. What went up and down? And the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightnings. And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning so quick. Well, tell me, that's only a little tiny portion of the whole vision. Do you understand it? The natural man will say, this is visionary. This is Eastern imagery. This is not really vital. This is not really relevant today. This is Jewish background. This is the sort of thing you find in the East today. That's their explanation. It suits them. But they learn nothing because they don't believe the Bible. You see, if you believe the Bible, then everything that that says in that vision has a meaning. Burning coals have a meaning. Lightning has a meaning. Numerology of four has a meaning. Lamps going up and down have a meaning. They all have meanings. You've got to know the Word of God. You've got to know what lightning symbolizes in the Word of God. You've got to know what fire symbolizes in the Word of God. Not in one scripture, but consistent throughout the Bible. What does fire mean? You've got to know all that. So you can't have inspiration until you believe that this is the entire inspired word of God without any contradictions. Do you believe that? If you don't, you've not started. You'll never have the Holy Ghost teach you because this is the word. It's spiritual. You've got to compare spiritual things with spiritual. If you don't believe in the spiritual things, how can you compare them? If you don't believe the Bible is spiritual, how can you compare it? You know where. You're in the dark. You stay there. You learn nothing of the things of God. But when you've learned what the number four means in the scriptures, right through. When you learn what lightning means, when you learn what fire means, when you learn what the lamps mean, when you learn what burning coals mean, when you learn all that and then you put it together, you'll still need the Holy Ghost. And you'll learn something today from the Holy Ghost. One spark of light. And tomorrow you may learn something more. And in a hundred years you'll learn something more. And that vision could keep you occupied through eternity. So marvelous is the word of God. How people can have three minutes on the Word of God, I don't understand. I meditated in day and night. It is a lamp unto our, my feet and a light unto our path. Jesus was the Word made flesh, so if we know the Word, we know Jesus. How can a Christian not meditate on the Word? They'll never have Holy Ghost teaching unless you become a student of the Word. We'll never have all this ghost teaching in this church if we bring men's fancy illustrations or what he might think about a story or what he might put behind a story that's no scriptural foundation. It's got to be the Word. We don't need those things. If the Word is preached, the Holy Ghost will give everyone in the church something. If the Word is preached. Holy Ghost teaching. Not jokes. Not making people laugh. Not personality. Not even the voice or the appearance of the man. Just a voice. And what did the voice say of the prophet in the wilderness? 
Did he give a, a fancy illustration? What did the voice say? He said the word. All flesh is grass. That's all human nature is grass. All human intellect is grass. All fallen nature is grass. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. That's Holy Ghost. Well, I'm not going on with that. I'd love to, but I want to give you a few illustrations. How do we compare spiritual things with spiritual? Healings are spiritual. Miracles are spiritual. They're not natural. I'm talking about divine healings. I'm not talking about medicine. I'm not talking about any kind of man's ways of getting people well and don't decry them. Okay, God bless them. And may people be relieved of pain and may they be helped and may they be comforted and may those things happen. But that's not divine healing. God may use them. But that's not divine healing. God doesn't need a second method. Divine healing is supernatural. And in its fullness it's perfect. But we're so full of doubts. I don't know whether you read a story in Redemption Tidings last week of, I think it's Isabel Chapman who was called of God and went out and her boss didn't know what had happened. She went straight out to some out of the way place because God called her and she had some marvellous experiences. And she was talking about this tribe that were full of sores and without God and blind and worshipping idols. And she put her hands on a woman who had a goiter. And she closed her eyes and she started to pray. And as she prayed, she felt the goiter going down under her hands. And then she thought she'd open her eyes because she couldn't believe it. And when she opened her eyes, she felt it growing back again. So she closed her eyes and asked God to forgive her for wanting to see it. And she prayed again and it went down and she was healed instantly. See how important it is the slightest doubt. The word is the word. I don't care what man says. God's word is true. I am the Lord that healeth thee. And if I never saw a healing, I believe that. Because the Holy Ghost has taught me that. And I don't doubt that. And if I die a terrible disease, I still believe it. I may not be strong enough to do what I think is right, but I still believe it. The Bible says so. Strong meat. But there's more in miracles and healings than we think. How can you get truth, real truth? The natural man explains the miracle away. It'll say, it's hypnosis. It will come back. Well, it was just a certain situation. He'll explain it away. But as soon as you do that, you stop God teaching you. Because in every miracle, in every healing, there's profound teaching. I'm not going to turn you to them because you know them so well. But let me just go through about three healings to close with. To show how the Holy Ghost teaches when we compare spiritual things with spiritual. We're going to compare miracles or healings with the spiritual word of God and see what it teaches. It'll teach us better than any man. Not empowered by an illustration from the mind or the book, but empowered by an illustration of the power of God. That's tremendous. It's all right talking about a miracle or a healing. It's a different thing when you see one. That does teach. Something happens and explodes in the spirit. That teaches. I want that. That's Holy Ghost teaching. Let me take you to John 5 for a minute. Here is a man lay between five porches and there's a multitude of sick people. And they're all waiting for the moving of the waters. An angel comes down and they're healed. And this man can't get down there. He's on a bed. He can't move down there. A whole multitude of sick, crippled, blind, lame. What a picture of the sinful soul. What a picture of the nature of man. Made in the image of God, here lying crippled, sick, in pain, blind, deaf, twisted. What a picture of the human soul. Jesus comes along, and there's no faith in the man as far as I can see, but Jesus tells him to take up his bed and he walks. And he immediately takes up his bed and walks. He's made whole in a second. Now, that can be explained away. But you miss everything if you explain it away. Because, you see, that man had been there a long time, 38 years. And everybody knew it. Listen to this, what it says in verse 39. Verse 17, sorry. 
after the miracle, there were those trying to explain it away or trying to deny it was of God. Jesus answered, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. What does that teach us? Because they denied the miracle, or because they didn't believe it, or because they opposed it, or they doubted it, whatever the reason, they missed a vital, wonderful truth. Here was God standing before them. He did a, a healing to show them he was God. He says, hitherto my father worked, but now I'm working. In other words, I'm God. And so they couldn't be taught of the Holy Ghost that Jesus was God. They couldn't have the revelation that Jesus was God because they doubted the miracle. Profound, you know, if you think about it. Let me give you another one. In the second chapter of Mark, we have an incident in verses 9 to 12 of a man brought by four on a bed. He couldn't walk. He was paralyzed. They couldn't get at Jesus for the crowd, so they let him through the roof. And Jesus said, Son, thy sins are forgiven thee. And all the people around and the Pharisees said, Who can forgive sins but God only? Only God can forgive sins. This man's claiming to be God. He's blaspheming. He says, So that you may know that the Son of Man or the Son of God hath power to forgive sins. I say unto you, arise and walk. And so he demonstrated by the power of a healing that he could forgive sins. Now, it's a very easy thing to say to people, look, Jesus died on the cross and your sins are forgiven. But to get them to believe it's a different matter. It's all right applying it to the mind and saying my sins are forgiven. But to have it deep in the spirit is a different matter. To know your sins are forgiven. There's many people make decisions and God in his great mercy reveals that they're forgiven. But I tell you, how would you feel if you saw a mighty miracle like this and then Jesus stood before you and said, because I can do that, I can forgive your sins. It's far more powerful, you know. That miracle speaks wonders. It shows he has power. If he can do that, he can forgive my sins. If he can raise a man up that's been on a bed beside the pool for 38 years, then he must be God. It's far more powerful than a lot of theological reasoning. It's so simple, you see. Can you see why in Jew we're not looking for the words of men? We're looking for the power of God. It would be devastating because you can say, you see that? The kingdom of God is near to you. The power of God is near to you. You see that? That's God's power. The same God who rose from the dead. The same God who can forgive your sins. That's power. I tell you, that's better than any illustration. It's better than the best theologian in the world. Because it's God's teaching. The Holy Ghost is teaching an illustration, not out of the mind or out of a story or something that interests the fancy, but he's teaching by a demonstration of power. It's an illustration of power to say that he has power to forgive sins. To say that he's the son of God. Every healing you'll find that Jesus had a profound truth. When the blind man in John 9 was at the roadside, his disciples said, who has sinned, this man or his parents, that this man is born blind? What did Jesus say? He says, neither this man nor his parents have sinned. Well, why is he blown blind? That the works of God may be revealed. That the works of God may be revealed. That God may demonstrate his power for blind men. That God may demonstrate his power to crash through unbelief. That God may demonstrate his power that people stop using the mind and have faith in God. And so he sees. And all kinds of arguments go on and doubts. Are you sure it's the same man? Was this the man? Parents, is this your son? Ask him. Are you the man? Where I was blind, now I see. But, but it can't be. Who did it? I don't know who did it, but one thing I do know. I was blind and now I see. Experience, you see. Spiritual power. And what did Jesus say when they argued about it? They said, are we blind also? He says, I have come that those that are blind 
may see. All around this healing. And those that see will be made blind. You see, when you think you know, when you intellectually and theologically think you know about God, when a miracle happens, you might become blind. Especially if you don't believe it, because you're closed to Holy Ghost teaching. But when you're outside and dark and in sin and a miracle happens, you might have your eyes opened, it explodes, and you say, God, this must be God. I couldn't understand it, I can't understand the mystery, but I can't deny that. You know, one truth that came to me was this. When we deny the miraculous power of God, we lose a lot of Holy Ghost teaching. It's all over the scripture. Next week, I want, or the next time I minister, I want to speak on miracles that are denied by modernists. But you cannot know the deep truths of God without them. You'll see how profound they are. So let us not doubt. And I know there are many questions about divine healing. I also know there's many questions about salvation. But I don't see among evangelicals much argument about salvation. If only one gets saved out of a hundred, they say, praise God, we preach the gospel. But if only one gets healed, they say, well, I wonder. Let's believe the same things. Let's be consistent. God said he will save. God said he will heal. The Bible's full of it. What happens is not our business, but we know the truth. The Holy Ghost will teach us. And we're in a battle. But we'll get nowhere without faith in the living God. That doesn't mean we blind our eyes to things that don't happen and we must have a, a good sound answer. We must be mature and we must have a sound answer why it didn't happen or a reason. But let us never doubt that God's perfect purpose is to heal. I was praying this morning. I want to close. I prayed to God. I said, Lord, in this June crusade, I know that I and my church will be target for tonight if you move. I know there'll be thousands, if you really move, that will criticize. I know that. And we should know it. And I said, Lord, I don't want to cause disruption or problems for your church or your people or for your name. I love you. I said, I don't want to cause those things. I said, what do we do? And the Lord just said to me, in my inner spirit. He just put it upon me. He said, Was I ever sick? I said, No, Lord. He says, Did anyone get refused from being healed who came to me? I said, No, Lord. He said, Didn't I not on occasion heal everyone? I said, Yes, Lord. Can you remember anywhere where I refused? I said, No, Lord. I said, only when there was doubt. So I've got to say to God, Lord, I'm fallen. I'm a sinful creature. Depart from me. I'm a sinful man. I can't understand the great shoal of fishes. Lord, I'm a child. Lord Jesus, I'll preach your healing message. Whatever else happens. Be merciful to me, a sinner the least of the least of the saints. And I'm going to do that. 